In the previous several videos, we were discussing the blade element momentum theory and how it can be used to design and optimize the shape of the wind turbine blades. We talked about an iterative algorithm for calculating the two induction factors, A and A prime. Once the induction factors are obtained, they can be used to compute the load on the turbine. Uh, for example, the normal force, the normal force and the torque on each annular ring can be computed using these two equations, which were given in the uh, ninth video. The two induction factors are used in the calculations for the relative wind and its um, uh, angle with respect to the rotor plane phi. Once the torque is computed, uh, we can compute the power generated by each annular ring, which is just the torque uh, multiplying the angular velocity. Uh, the power generated by the entire rotor disk is just a summation of the power generated by each ring. So we can compute the power output of the rotor based on any given conditions. So if we plot the generated power as a function of uh, the free stream wind speed, the input free stream wind speed, we obtain the so-called uh, power curve. In fact, if you purchase a wind turbine, the manufacturer will also provide you with such a curve. But the curve provided by the manufacturer will be different from the one that you've computed using the BEM theory. So the blue curve here, the blue curve here is the power in the wind, in the free stream wind, which is proportional to the cube of the free stream wind speed. The black curve, this black curve, which lies underneath the blue curve, is the wind turbine's power curve provided by uh, the manufacturer. So in region 2, in this particular region, in this particular region, the difference between the manufacturer's curve and the curve computed using uh, BEM theory can be quite a small. Right? The difference can be quite a small. Right? But in region 1, in this particular region, and also in region 3, the differences can be quite significant. First, there is a cutting speed, cutting wind speed, or W cutting here. Below this particular speed, the wind turbine is not generating any power at all. So either the blade is not rotating, or it's rotating but it's not actually producing power. Right? This is called the cutting speed. For modern commercial grade wind turbine, the cutting wind speed is about 3 to 4 meters per second, or uh, 7 to 9 uh, miles per hour. Second, there is a rated wind speed, or W rated here. Above, above this rated wind speed, the power output reaches its maximum capacity and stays flat at this so-called rated power. The generated power does not decrease. With, uh, does not increase. The generated power does not increase with the wind speed uh, anymore, which is to protect uh, the electric generator. If the generator is overloaded for too long, it may burn. So, so the manufacturer provided power curve uh, will, will will typically look like a flat thing over this range, right? And depending upon the exact mechanism, uh, for either for pitching the blades or for uh, other mechanical uh, uh, mechanical control that we are we are going to discuss later on, there might be fluctuations, right? Below or above it for like a ten percent or something, but it cannot exceed uh, sort of ch exceed ch deviate deviate from this uh, flat line by too much for too long. And the typical rated wind speed, typical weighted, uh, rated uh, uh, wind speed ranges from uh, about 11 to 15 meters per second, or 25 to 35 miles per hour. Uh, third, when the wind speed reaches the cutout speed, or W cutout here, which is around 25 meters per second for a typical large turbine, the entire turbine is shut down. This is to protect the mechanical structure of the turbine. At such a high wind speed, 
the mechanical stress could be uh, really big, really damaging. The power curve is purely a characteristic of the wind turbine. It alone cannot tell us how much energy is generated per year, which is often called the annual energy production, or AEP. In order to compute AEP, we need another piece of information, which is the characteristic of the wind at the side of the wind turbine. There are basically two approaches for obtaining the wind characteristics for a site. One approach is based on directly mirroring and using wind speed data collected at the site. The other approach is based on statistical estimate using predefined probability distributions. In the first approach, wind speed data can be collected directly using an anemometer. This figure shows how the wind speed varies as a function of time throughout one year at two different sites. These two different sites are actually at uh, uh, UK. It's actually two different locations in UK. So, so, so the red curve is for this particular location, and uh, the green curve is for Plymouth. And the vertical axis is actually the wind speed, meters in, in terms of meters per second. Right. And then the vertical the horizontal axis is day of year. It's the it's a time axis. Right. Um, so every data point, every data point is the wind speed um, averaged over a certain time interval, which could be a day, an hour, or even one minute. Once we have obtained such data, then we can divide the vertical axis, which is the wind speed axis into many, many small bins, right? Into many, many small bins. Right? And then we can count. And we can count the number of data points falling into each bin. So if we, if we plot the number of data points that falls into those different velocity bins, we obtain something that's called a wind speed histogram. It's, a, it's called a wind speed histogram. So the horizontal axis is the wind speed, basically. That's the wind speed. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's basically the center location of all those different bins that they have created along the vertical axis. Right? And that becomes the horizontal axis. So the horizontal axis indicates the location of the bins. The location of the bins in terms of the wind speed. So you have a bin here, you have a bin here, small bins. Lots of lots of small things, and then the vertical axis, basically the height, the height of the bars, tells you how many data points are inside of each of the bin, each of the velocity bins. Remember that each data point is associated with a certain time interval. So each data point is some kind of average for the wind speed of a small time interval, right? Then by counting, counting the number of data points. Inside of those data, uh, inside of each bin, we can obtain the total amount of time during which the wind was blowing at the speed associated with that bin. Right. So all we have to do is to count how many data points we have, right? And then use that number, the number of data points, multiply the the duration associated with each of the data points. For example, if one data point, every data point is, is an average for a duration of one hour, right? And then I have like five data points in one bin, in this bin, for example, right? And then five times one hour, five hours. So at this particular speed, which is about one knot, right? At this speed, one knot, it's blowing for like five hours per year, right? So, so, so this way I can actually, um, uh, I, I can actually sort of, Obtain the duration of the of the of the wind speed uh, for uh, per year. So energy is basically power multiplying duration. Right, we can obtain the power at each wind speed from the power curve. Right, the supplied power curve. We can obtain the power. We can obtain the power from the supplied power curve, and then. Uh, 
this uh, this uh, wind speed histogram tells us the duration of each of the wind speed within a year, right? And then all we have to do is to actually multiply. Uh, all we have to do is to just multiply the the, the in order to actually obtain the energy production per year or AEP, all we need to do is ju just to, to multiply the power and the duration at the same wind speed, and then sum over all wind speeds. So this is going to give us the AEP. If those direct wind speed measurements are not available at a certain site, we can take the second approach, which is based on statistical methods. People have found that the Weibull distribution can usually provide a good fit to the wind speed histogram. So it can be used, so it has been used widely to approximate wind speed histograms. The probability density function, the probability density function for the Weibull distribution has two uh, parameters that allows users to adjust its shape. Uh, here, capital U, capital U is the wind speed. So the parameter K is called the shape factor. And it controls the shape, in particular the, the location of the peak of the distribution. And when k actually equals to 2, here, here it's not k, it's beta, right? So, so, so when k actually equals to 2, the Weibull distribution is identical to the so-called Rayleigh distribution, which is also used quite widely to approximate the wind speed histograms. So in some sense, the Weibull distribution is some kind of generalization of the Rayleigh distribution. And in practice, the optimal k value is often selected around the value 2. Right? And the parameter c, the parameter c is called the scale factor. This scale factor basically controls the width of the function. So, 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 so for large c, it could be quite wide. Right? For, for small c, it could be quite narrow. And in practice, the optimal C is often selected at around the average wind speed. So if you do not know the wind speed histogram exactly, you can use this kind of function to approximate it. Right? And in this case, all you need to know is the, 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 the approximate value of, this, of the average wind speed at that particular site. Right? And this kind of average value can often be obtained by uh, from, 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 from government agencies or from uh, scientific communities. Right? And then all you have to do is to get an estimate about the shape factor. Right? This, this kind of shape factor, maybe, maybe you have some information from uh, one nearby site about the shape, shape factor, right? and then you can adopt that shape, shape factor. Right? You can sort of try to guess a reasonable shape factor. Once you have determined these two factors, you get the entire Weibull distribution. And then you can use that Weibull distribution to approximate the wind speed histogram, basically. Um, the cumulative distribution, Fu here, is the integral of the probability density function. It gives the probability of wind speed at or below speed u. So it's the probability of wind speed at or below the, the, the speed u. So the derivative of the cumulative probability is the probability density. If we rearrange this particular equation, we obtain this equality. And later on, we are going to use this equality when deriving the AEP. So for, for this particular wind speed histogram that we have looked at, this is for uh, Plymouth right, in England. Right. And the best fit Weibull distribution has a shape factor of about 1.667 and it looks like this particular black curve. And you can sort of see, it actually gives, gives you a quite good approximation. Right? So in the absence of the exact wind speed histogram, you could use just a, this curve to approximate it. Right? Of course, there will be some deviations, right? but that's kind of inevitable because you are using some kind of, right? because you are lacking information. You don't really have all the information. Um, if you are using the statistical approach to estimate the, the annual energy production, all we have to do is to actually just multiply the power curve of the wind turbine that's supplied by the manufacturer with the probability density. 
and then integrate over all possible uh, wind speeds. Right? And then multiply this integral with this number. This number is actually the total number of hours per year because we are estimating annual energy production or AEP. So, 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 so these probability densities basically gives you some kind of uh, some kind of a uh, proportion proportion of uh, the number of uh, hours per year, right? So, 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 so multiplying the total number of hours per year gives you basically just the um, the total number of hours that the wind is actually blowing at that particular speed, right? And the PUDU equals to DFU, right? You remember that. So if we replace the integral with the summation over uh, MB bins, right? Then DFU, DFU can be approximated as sort of the difference. The FU can be estimated as the difference between the FU, FU at the left boundary of the bin and the FU at the right boundary of the bin. Right? The, 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 the FU has the expression that looks like that. Right? One is a constant. Right? One is a constant. So if you subtract uh, two different FUs, so one is going to cancel out. What you are left out is just uh, this exponential. Right? So that's why you have these two exponentials subtracting each other. And then one is at the left boundary, and then the other one is at the right, right boundary of the, of the bin. Right? And then PWU, that's the power uh, of the turbine. This can be obtained from the power curve, turbine's power curve. right? And what we want to do is to actually take the power value at the center of the bin. Right, so the, the that's the left boundary of the bin. That's the right boundary of the bin. So, so the average of it is the center of the bin. The center of the wind speed at the bin. And we, what we want to get to is the power at that particular center wind speed of the bin. And then still multiply the total number of hours per year. A slightly different approach for computing the AEP is to use the so-called velocity duration curve. This kind of velocity duration curve. So every point on this curve gives you the duration. So if you look at one point, one point, it gives you the duration in terms of the hours for, for the wind to have a speed that's either at or exceeding this particular velocity, a given velocity. Remember that the cumulative distribution is the probability of wind speed either at or below a given speed, right? So what the velocity duration curve is actually giving you is actually this one subtract the cumulative distribution, right? And then multiplying the total number of hours per year. So we know that the power of the wind is sort of proportional to the cube. Of the wind speed. So if we just cube the vertical axis and do some kind of scaling, constant scaling, then we can convert this velocity axis into a power axis. Right. And at this point, we can actually incorporate the power curve of the wind turbine. So every velocity on this curve is mapped to a power value on the turbine, on the turbine's uh, power curve. And then the, the power curve, the value that we read from the power curve is being plotted, is being plotted at, uh, at, the, at uh, on, on this particular graph, on, on this particular curve, on this particular curve. And this curve is the so-called turbine power duration curve. It's called power duration curve. And uh, the AEP, the AEP can just be obtained for the area as the area underneath this power duration curve. Right? 